I'm Dr. Ezreal Cornell, and you're a surgeon in the New York metropolitan area. That means that I am a brain and spine surgeon, and in fact, I'm a partner in Brain and Spine Surgeons of New York, in White Plains, New York. I operate at several hospitals, both in Westchester County and in Manhattan. I'm Assistant Clinical Professor of Neurosurgery at Weill Cornell Medical Center. Welcome to this educational segment about herniated lumbar discs. In this segment, we're going to talk about surgery to remove herniated lumbar discs. First of all, what is a herniated disc? A herniated disc, which we've discussed in other segments, which I hope you'll watch as well, is when a disc extrudes from the confines of the disc itself to compress a nerve. We have a picture, an MRI, showing an extruded disc right here. This is the spinal canal with the nerves running through it. These are the discs, and these are normal appearing discs. This dark disc is a degenerated disc, and we see a portion of the, of the disc itself has now extruded into the spinal canal and is compressing the nerves. So let's look at our friend Lurch to get a better idea of the anatomy. Here we have the, the spine. This is the lumbar spine, the lower back. These are the spinous processes that you feel when you run your hand up and down the back. They flare out to form the roof of the spine, referred to as the lamina, and further out they form the joints of the spine, the facet joints. Those joints are what allow for movement of the spine. Inside the spinal canal run the nerves, what are referred to as the cauda equina, or horse's tail. In the front of the spine, we have the vertebral bodies, which are the building blocks of the spine, and in between are the cushions, referred to as the discs. The nerves come out or go into the spine through this opening called the foramen, between the disc and the joint. So when a disc herniates, like we see in that picture, it can compress the nerve as it's coming out, or it can compress multiple nerves within the spinal canal. Today we're going to be talking about removal of just an extruded fragment, or what's called a microdiscectomy. In the way that I do it, it's referred to as an endoscopic microdiscectomy. So, the standard approach that was used for many years was to enter the spine through an incision in the center of the spine. There are muscles that come across, of course, to attach to the spine that pull the spine, allowing for movement. There are ligaments between the vertebrae that hold the vertebrae together and the joints together. In order to get into the spine in the standard technique, the muscles and the tendons that hold the muscles to the bone have to be cut and the, the muscle is pulled over to expose the bone. A portion of the bone is then removed, which is referred to as a laminectomy. And the generic term for any spine surgery that involves removal of a disc is called a laminectomy. However, we don't remove the entire lamina, and most times, even with the most standard techniques, only a portion of the lamina is removed. That allows for access into the spine, and then once one is in the spine, the nerves can be moved aside, and the extruded disc fragment, which is then visualized, is able to be plucked out. With a microdiscectomy, it means that the incision is a bit smaller, and in order to visualize the nerves well and the extruded disc well, a microscope is used to magnify the operative site. The technique that I like to use, which is a minimally invasive technique, is what is referred to as a endoscopic microdiscectomy. It means that rather than dividing the muscle and tendons off of the spine, we're able to separate out the muscle fibers through a very small, about two centimeter opening in the skin. And then we insert a tube through the skin, separating the muscle down to the edge of the bone. Through that tube, we can then put in an endoscope with fiber optic camera and see the internal structures that way. Or we can actually look through the tube 
with a microscope, which is the way I prefer to do it. That gives us a direct three-dimensional image. And then we can enter the space between the vertebrae, between the lamina. Often, because the lamina are overlapping, we have to remove a small amount of it. But generally, I have to remove less than the size of my fingernail in order to be able to make an opening to gain access. There is a ligament called the yellow ligament that goes between the lamina that overlies the nerves. That ligament helps to protect the nerves. Through this type of approach, we need to remove very little of that ligament. And I generally remove only a small, small portion of the ligament, a few fibers, off to the side to gain access into the spinal canal from the side. Once we gain access, then we can see the nerve and we can see the extruded disc fragment. Because we have had such high magnification, we're able to see these structures well. And then through that very small opening, we can pluck out that fragment of disc, relieving the pressure on the nerve. We can then remove that tube, the muscles come back together, and we make a small closure in the skin. Usually we don't have to use sutures on the outside. All the sutures are buried, so there are no stitches to remove. And patients go home the same day. Generally, the pain from the herniated disc that has caused pressure on the nerve is relieved right away, and people feel the relief of pain in the leg when they wake up. There's certainly some soreness to the back because there is an incision made. There's no way to get into the spine without making an incision. Um, so, though it is Band-Aid surgery often referred to in that way, it still does require an incision. And that incision, of course, will be sore for a few days. Um, but people are walking around and go home the same day and are able to be up and about. I like people to, I like my patients to rest and to limit their physical activity for several weeks. The likelihood of that disc reherniating, because we're not removing the entire disc, we're only removing the portion of the disc that has extruded itself and is pressing on the nerve. So there is still disc remaining inside. It may not be functional disc in the sense of a healthy spongy disc, but it is maintaining that disc space. The likelihood of that disc herniating again in the future is somewhere around 15%, especially if you take care of your back after the surgery, meaning if you strengthen your core muscles, if you watch your alignment, and if you're careful about the way you use your back, that you don't try to move heavy furniture without help, that you are attentive to the way you're moving, the likelihood of a reherniation becomes quite small. So the surgery is very effective in relieving the symptoms and the likelihood that you will be able to live a normal functional life is very high, well above 90%. So thank you for watching this instructional video about surgery on herniated lumbar discs. We hope this was of value to you, and please join us for other instructional videos about spine and brain surgery.